Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with the town of Riverview, New Brunswick, Councillor Cecile Casista. Riverview is a place for people who appreciate the physical, mental, and spiritual value of being embraced by nature. The town of Riverview is bordered on three sides by the Acadian Forest and by the Petakotica River on the northern boundary. The town of Riverview boasts large lots on streets lined with big old trees, which put you in the center of untamed but often groomed wilderness and still a stone's throw from urban New Brunswick. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Cecile Casista. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start by getting to know the person behind the persona of a councillor, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you are no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Cecile? Well, first of all, you know, my passion is serving the communities. And uh, I lived in Winnipeg for 30 years. I've been in Ontario. And I've always served the public and, and collaborated with many people. When I moved here in 2023, my focus was actually to actually concentrate on traveling and enjoy my retirement. But that didn't happen. I moved on to, uh, to uh, doing ad advocacy work for um seniors and I was really floored when I was asked to do it because I said you know that's not my expertise I've never done anything with the elderly I've always did the child care component I come from uh, a union environment I work with the Canadian auto workers for 30 years so actually I've got a, a lot of background to talk about but anyway in short um Actually, I got involved in Riverview by hosting and organizing uh, panels for election debates, municipal, federal, and uh, provincial. And after doing that, I got a little bit of a taste that I really wanted to move on. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, I'm really going to be going for politics. And he said, well, you had promised me, you know, that you would not do that. But I said, you know what, it's in me, I need to do it. I felt that I had the passion and the expertise to be able to give back to the community in Riverview. So, so in 2012, I ran uh, my very first time and I thought, I'm going to give it a go. And you know what, I came in second and I was like very excited about that. Uh, along with today, the mayor, uh, Andrew LeBlanc, him and I worked together in the community and uh, he got in as well. So. Uh, from that journey, uh, I can tell you that we've accomplished a lot in Riverview. We've made a lot of effective changes. Uh, communication was a big piece for all of us uh, that, that got elected. We wanted to make sure that the residents were felt closer. We were addressing their needs, and we worked very hard on that. But one of the big pieces that really stands out was the recreational uh, complex that I can remember saying to the mayor, she's a brand new mayor and five new councillors, I'm saying, no, but we really need that that complex. And this is a challenge because this person was on council for 20 some years and now became mayor. Is that, what am I gonna do with five brand new councillors? But we worked very closely together. We kept it all positive. And today, you know, we will be breaking ground shortly on our rec recreational complex. The other big piece that I feel really excited about 
was the fact that prior to being elected, I always heard people saying, I want my street done, I want my street done. So we basically as council came together and said to staff, we need all of, every one of our streets to be analyzed to determine what is the priority, take the politics out of it. And we did that and we're still working on our infrastructure. And that's exciting and exciting when we see all the three new roundabouts that basically are in town. Uh, we Every year at budget time, we go and we deal with uh, infrastructure. We deal with a whole host of other things. But in the interim of that, in 2013, council, we talked about having, uh, you know, some other uh, in information that we could deal with. Uh, what about Mill Creek? So we started on building Mill Creek. Mill Creek is the gym, and I'll talk to you about later about that, but is the gym of our community. And we need to promote it and continue talking about it, how important it is. Uh, so today I am, I've served two, two terms as deputy mayor. Just had a council meeting last night, it was exciting. Uh, we deal with a lot of rezoning because as you know, in Riverview, we're not near the airport. We are not near a highway, so we have to look at other areas to bring in our income. I also serve as a director for the Union of Municipalities. When I got elected in 2021, uh, the mayor asked me if I would be interested, and I jumped for joy and said, you know, anything to be able to bring back to the community. Um, on the weekend, actually, we spent the weekend at our board meeting. And that's exciting times because we are bringing in new members, we're growing the uh, municipalities, um, but also as a zone director, along with uh, the mayor of uh, Pratamar, Andrew Black, him and I are zone directors. And so we're in the process of putting together our zone meeting. And I'm excited about the zone meeting because way back prior to 2000, well, before in the 2000, after I got elected, they were not good turnouts. And we have, we packed the halls, 30 to 40 people. And we have a community, each municipality hosts the event, which is really exciting because this one is Fundy Albert, who's going to be hosting at the, um, in, in their community. So we're looking forward to that and seeing what we can do to energize our membership, our municipal elected officers. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> That is probably the most comprehensive answer that I've ever gotten on this show, and I love it already. Um, so there's a lot to unpack, but I want to start with the basic question. And I but, and I say that knowing that I, I, I anticipate a long answer, and I love that because I can dive more into depth onto some of the issues. Your background tells me that municipal politics probably wasn't your first choice in the, the political realm. With a background in union organizing, with working with the CAW, I can imagine you were probably more, I don't want to say interested because I, I, I never want to assume, but I, I can imagine your background would have put you into a prime spot to be elected provincially, heck, even federally. But in 2012, you decide municipal what was the decision municipally for yourself? Was it that conversation with your husband or was there something else deeper that goes into your decision to go municipally? Well, interesting. I'm glad you asked me that question because when we were thinking about moving back home, and this is home to us, um, I did a lot of research because I was on sabbatical leave and I actually was Googling and working on the website of Moncton and something took me to Riverview and I noticed, and it always stays with me, uh, two women on council. And I thought, ah, that's got to change. That's got to change. And it did change. Uh, we did have, uh, you know, gender balance at one time. We're back down to two women again, but it will change. We just got to keep working at it. But I think the importance of it is... Um, working with the community, because the municipal politics is closer, local government is closer to the people, and we can deliver a much quicker. Uh, and I think that I'm so passionate about it. Uh, I mean, I work day and night that I want to give back to the community. Um, and I do it because I have a spouse that's very supportive of me. And so I don't do the housework, cleaning, cooking or anything. I'm out in the community, work in the community, seeing what I can do, because I realize as an individual out there, you don't know all the aspects of, of what goes on in, 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 in municipal government or provincial. Now, I've been, you know, contacted many times to run for provincial. 
but that's just not my cup of tea at this point. I'm very comfortable because I still have some work to do uh, in municipal. I mean, I was one of the founders of, along with another colleague, we formed the Town of Riverview Seniors Roundtable. It's been in existence since 2006. And just a few weeks ago, we were designated age-friendly community. So we have an action plan. We have lots of work to do there. So I have to finish that agenda. The other piece of that as well, I was also a co-founder uh, building the Coalition for Seniors and, and actually representing New Brunswickers and being a voice for New Brunswickers because it's a very complex world out there. So my passion, I guess, continues to grow to help people. You have a very strong passion for your community. And it, 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 like I, we've only been chatting for less than 10 minutes now, and I can see it already shining through. But the average resident, and, and, and I, I hate to paint a broad stroke here, but I'm going to a little bit. The average resident has an apathy when it comes to that municipal level of governance. Do you find that in Riverview? And how do you engage with people in your community who and say to me on a regular basis, not in your community, but across Canada, as long as my water's picked up, my water turns on in the morning and my garbage is picked up, I really don't uh, don't really pay attention to what's going on in at City Hall or in Riverview. Is that the exact opposite? Are more and more people being as engaged as you are or were prior to entering into politics before 2012? Is there an apathy in Riverview that is sort of sweeping across Canada and not is being transposed in Riverview as well? Well, I really think that Riverview is very unique, but I also think that the people are no different than other parts of the country as well. I mean, unless you're deeply involved and wanting to affect change, you're going to wait for the leadership to do it for you. And I think it's important that you share your experience. I mean, we just had a public meeting last night. It was interesting hearing people speak, you know, from the heart and their concerns. And that's what we as counselors are about where I'm about listening to the people, but I also have to look at the town as a whole. We have to make sure that the town as a whole is represented and we want to move forward. Um, we don't want to stay stagnant. You know, 50 years ago, last year, we celebrated 50 years. And I remember reading that there was three houses 50 years ago. Today, we're at 20, over 21,000 in this town. We're the largest town. It's, it's wonderful. It's very unique. And it's um, homecoming, uh, easy to access to the cities of Moncton and Dieppe and anywhere you want to go. But it's very, it's got a, a different feel, a different feel. And people really, it's an active family town. But by the same town, same tone, people uh, really, you know, um, can collaborate together. I mean, I help organize uh, monthly meetings of 100 and some people every month with my husband for seniors that come together. And it's wonderful being able to send that technology, that email out to them, or they have a phone tree and reaching out to people and bringing information to them. I think that's important because the average person out there does not understand politics. And when it hits their pocketbook, yes. I was about to say, unless it hits their pocketbook, then I'm assuming you're hearing from every resident, every all 21,000 of those households. Um, I, I want to talk about the role of a counselor for a second, if you don't mind. And you talk about the decisions that have to be made for the future, the longevity. 50 years ago, there were three houses. Now there is substantially more than three houses how do you make those decisions? Because at the end of the day, the people have elected you to make those tough decisions, but you have to balance the realities of the here and now with the future longevity of your community that in 50 years, someone can look back and say, oh, we only had this many houses in 2024. Now look at us. How do you balance as a counselor? And I say this as just as a single counselor, knowing that you are one vote on said council. How do you balance balance the, the community's interest with the sort of future vision of what the council is looking for 20, 25, 50 years from now? 
Well, for me, I mean, I think about the residents who elected me, who put me in that chair. But I also know that we have some tough decisions and it's very important to do your homework. It's not about just getting a package from the staff and then, you know, reading it. I think it's pretty important to do your homework and research and listen to the people as well and do a balance. But we also have to look at the Community Planning Act. We have to look at the Municipal Planning Act. And we have to look at the overall picture. How does it benefit the town as a whole? Uh, and those are tough decisions, very tough. And I think that we have to have the courage to be able to say to the people, look, I've done this, I've done that. Unless you convince me differently, I can't support that. You know. But if I lose the battle, I lose the vote, uh, I walk away and we still work together. It's a very different kind of council I'm hearing around the province. Our council works together and we put it aside and, you know, we have votes, we win, we lose, but we try to work together to compromise. And that's what I see this council do when we look at uh, alternatives. I'm not one to compromise a whole lot. Uh, when I get dug in and I want to give some money to a certain group, um, I, I actually feel passionate about it. I'm not one to, to, to compromise, but I will go with the flow and support them. I, I'm assuming after two and a half terms as a counselor, you've, you've come to the realization that you've had to make some pretty tough choices that are not going to please 100% of the people in your community. No matter what decision you make as a municipal counselor, there's always going to be some people who just disagree with you on the vision that you have, the vision that council has, so on and so forth. How important is it, because you talk about the people who voted for you, how important is it for yourself to not only listen to those people who did vote for you, but the people who didn't vote for you as well, who might disagree with you on some of those key issues that you believe are so passionate, because you're there to elect or represent everyone, not just the people who voted for you, correct? Well, I'm a elected at large, councillor at large, and I'm always proud that I got over 4,000 votes at the last election. I mean, I, I brag about it. Uh, but I didn't campaign. All I did was, because of COVID, I had my cards that went out in the mail, I had my car decorated, but I'm well known in the community. And I think that says a lot for itself. And that, you know, if someone brings me an issue and I can't resolve it, I'll take it to the staff and to see if we can find ground, middle ground on it. But I'm not winning all the battles. And I mean, you know, people understand that. But the fact that you're having that conversation with them and that you're listening to them, I think that makes all the difference. I'll give you an example when we had just in my area where uh, a number of seniors wanted a crosswalk and they were determined they wanted this crosswalk because they it was a busy street. And so, you know, without me even saying to them, this is what you have to do, they wrote a number of letters and they shared them and I sent them to, to the department and we have our crosswalk, they were so happy. But we're not going to win them all. I mean, we just have to understand that it's reality out there. The town is growing and we have to be, we're grown adults. So we need to understand each other and how we work together. Uh, one of the things I really want to say, though, the town of Riverview staff are just unique. I find them very unique. Anytime that you want to communicate with them and respond, they're back, you know, they're right there to help you. So I think that's very fortunate when I, here, other municipalities don't have that luxury. We're very fortunate in Riverview. You, you, you certainly I, are. Uh, our CAO, we have a great CAO, uh, and not because you know, um, you know, I'm actually on his review committee or anything, but he is very articulate. He's very articulate, and if you bring something to his attention, he may not like it, but he certainly will give you the answer. Uh, I think. That brings itself, enhances our town to have somebody that you trust and you can work with and he has good staff that will deliver. How, you bring up a good question that I I, I traditionally, I, I've never really asked on this show. I might've asked once or twice, but never on a reoccurring basis. On a regular basis, on a weekly basis, when you have those council meetings, you have an agenda package that is presented to you by council, by administration with their recommendations on what's going forward. You have to balance what, what the... 
a great question. We get our package every two weeks we meet, but sometimes there's more meetings, budget time, that kind of thing. But on a regular basis, we receive our package on Thursday. And I'm so proud that our package is not 400 pages like it was in 2012, and that we had to go through it and spend days working at it. It's on eScribe and it's all clicked in. I'm, I'm just so proud of that. And I can do my homework much quicker. And I've introduced that into the unions of municipalities. We have eScribe as well there. And uh, I chuckle when I when the package comes in because it makes our job as counselor much easier. But when the package comes in, um, we have a choice. We can make a motion to support or not support. But we are given uh, what they call a council report form with all the data for us to question. And I think that's important. That is something new that was introduced by the, the CAO, which he's been with us about eight years now. So that is very helpful for us as council to be able to get the background information. We may not like it, but we can question it. We can make motions to move it forward or not. The good thing about our council is that we have the committees of whole. So you make recommendations and then the regular council meeting, you actually adopt it. So you get a chance to think back and say, did I make the right decision or can I make a motion to change it? How do you balance the recommendation from administration with the what the residents want? Because that is probably the toughest part of any uh, municipal council meeting is trying to find a balance, whether accepting the administration's uh, recommendation carte blanche or sort of changing it up a little bit to adhere to what residents want. Is there a balance that you strike to try to make sure that everyone comes out happy or is that part of the tough decision-making that you have to do as a counselor? It's part of the tough decision as well, but based on the information they've given us, and sometimes we will just say, well, we need more information. We'll send it back. And, you know, before we make the concrete decision, but for the most part, uh, we, I have found that they have done their job thoroughly because they've been given direction by council to get this information to us. So um, it works well, um, but you know, I mean, there are challenges along the way and we may not agree, uh, but I think that it's important that uh, we work together. If we don't work together, we're not going to accomplish the goals. One last question I have before we turn to the issues that are facing Riverview as a whole. I want to ask about the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays compared to other levels of government. You've talked just recently about how people will come up to you and ask you questions or uh, ask you questions about crosswalks uh, or want a crosswalk in their area. Are you finding that there's a blurring of jurisdictional lines within Riverview that more and more people probably since the pandemic are coming up to you and asking you about issues that are not even in the municipal jurisdiction, whether that be healthcare, education, or is there a sense that you get from your community that people understand that the municipality has a role to play and the province has a role to play and heck, even the federal government has a role to play, or are they coming to you because you are the closest to them and and it's probably more likely that they know who you are compared to their MLA or their MP. Well, I get a mixture of questions and many of them don't understand that it's either provincial or federally. Uh, I would take, for instance, the, the, uh, the dental plan. They didn't know whether it was provincial or, or, or municipal, what role we play. So once you explain that to them, I guess I'm a little bit fortunate as a counselor. I don't sound biased, but because I'm involved in the provincial jurisdiction of, of advocating for change, but I'm also in the federal. I watched that as well. I just seen where they made a huge announcement this morning on health care and long term care. So that's exciting. And I can't wait to do that interview today. But because these are good things and positive things. And I think that if all governments work together, we can achieve our goal. But sometimes we don't see that. We see the politicking being a little bit different in, in provincial and federally. So it's important that provincially doesn't download to the municipal and let municipal do their work because we are the closest. And But I do get calls from all three you know, provinces or jurisdictions. And sometimes, you know, it's um, difficult for that person to understand how, how it works. 
Uh, for instance, when I was away and I got this email, people were upset because of their taxes. And they didn't understand that the assessment is done by the province. And, and I had to explain that to them. So I sent them a text the other day and said, look, it's coming up at council. Here's the link that you can watch Streamline and you can watch what we're going to be doing. So I think that by sharing that information gives them a comfort that we are not giving up on them and that we are going to continue working on it. I have, um, I guess, the... It's important for me to be on the zone and the UMB board because I get access to information that I can share with the uh, municipalities. So I do mail outs. I work with my colleague, Andrew Black, as well. So we share information. Uh, we found when we both got elected that communication and sharing information is the biggest piece. Now, I was going to turn to Riverview for a second, but I, I'm remiss to not ask this question because you brought it up at the beginning of the interview and I sort of let it slide and I feel bad for letting it slide. Um, you said, and I'm quoting here, I'm not quoting verbatim, but you, you talked about how you got involved in municipal politics because you saw parity needed at that council table. You saw two female councillors uh, prior to the 2012 election. You said, we need more women representatives. Why is it important for yourself to advocate for more women involvement in municipal politics? It's extremely important. I'll tell you why, because a lot of people don't know the ins and outs and the regulations, uh, and they rely on leaders like ourselves to be able to share that information or to get the information. So it's important for me to continue doing that as long as I can. I feel good if I'm able to say, you know what, I accomplished that today. But I do get calls that says, you know, I'm calling you because so-and-so, but it wouldn't, won't reveal the name, told me to call you because you will make it happen. And I got labeled with that. And I said, well, that's a big call, you know, a big call for me to make. So I have to explain to them, look, I'm going to do my best, but, you know, I can't promise everything. And that's one of the things as a counselor, not to promise. You do your best because you work together collectively. What do you see as the barrier from getting more women involved in politics, in your opinion? I think that the more opportunities that we can collaborate, town hall meetings, being involved in the community, engaging people is critical. I mean, I, you know, I'm one of the founders, again, at Neighborhood Watch, and I talked to one of our colleagues last night saying, we need to get our meetings together because we have 80 associated captains that actually work in the community, but we're the steering committee. We need to collaborate, communicate, do all those things. And when people see you working in the community, they are actually very appreciative of that. I appreciate your answers there. So I wanna turn because I'm cautious of time and I've just realized we're at the half hour mark. So hopefully you have an extra 10 minutes for me, but I wanna to turn to the town of Riverview as a whole now. And before I ask this question, as I always do, I'm gonna preface it by saying, this is a conversation between the councilor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councilor's opinion and her opinion alone. Uh, it may match up to what council is going uh, talking about right now, but it's her opinion with that being said i just want to get that off the record on the record counselor in your opinion what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the community today as of recording this episode one of the biggest issues that i see is actually growing our town rezoning to accommodate developers because we don't have the housing affordable housing per se in this town and when we have um, you know, 14,000 seniors from age 50 to 100 in this town and 10 that are over 100 that want to live in their community, that want to live in their homes. We need to look seriously at making sure that we have affordable uh, living accommodations for them. So that's the biggest piece for me. Uh, because, well, for me, and there's others, but that one there stands out because we're in the process of doing rezoning to accommodate developers, and that's tough on our residents because they don't want to see apartments in their backyard or, you know, they're, they, they're comfortable where they are. They want the trees and they fail to say that those trees don't belong to them. But I find that we have to work closer with the developers to try to accommodate the community's needs. Not gonna make, make it all happy. You know, that's not all gonna happen. But we also have to look at smaller homes affordable because today, uh, you know, not everybody can afford seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes. Five hundred. I mean, I can say five years ago, my home was 
I had it built for 250,000. It's worth over 500,000, you know, but the younger families today can't afford that. So uh, rezoning, I mean, I'm on the committee and I'm looking forward to working with the community on that to hear from the people what they would like to see. Um, dealing with the round table, that is part of uh, our job looking at housing. And I sent a, a message out to the chair and said, what are we putting on the agenda for tomorrow? He came back and said, affordable housing. Uh oh, what's that mean? We're gonna have a discussion on affordable housing, obviously. But I really think that that's a tough call for me because I see the people saying, no, I don't want it. But by the same token, I have to look at the balance of the Municipal Act, the Community Planning Act, the developer's application, the recommendation from the staff, that all has to be balanced. So there's two questions that are have to be posed with that statement that you just made there. The first question is, are developers knocking on the door of Riverview today and saying, we want to build in your community? We have a lot of applications before us. Okay. And prior to that, we were known, prior to 2012, we were known as we're not open for business. I don't want to see that. I want to see that we are growing so we can support our small businesses. When I talk to the small businesses and they say to me, you know, we can't get workers because they have nowhere to live in Riverview. And that makes, energizes me to work harder and to explain to the people how important it is to have housing. Okay, so the second question has to be then asked, housing is not a, a municipal issue. Zoning is, but housing isn't. You can dictate where the zone, what what types of housing goes into which type of zones. But at the end of the day, you can't go out and build the houses. You can try to attract residents, but it cannot rely fall solely on the backs of the municipality because it costs an arm and a leg to put infrastructure in the ground to sort of uh, build those houses that developers are doing. Is Riverview set up to ensure that the growth that you want, the affordable housing that you need, doesn't come on the backs of the people who are there here and now in the community? Or is there a balance that needs to be struck that the growth that is happening is going to be incrementally balanced on the backs of the people with their issues of the here and now? Well, what I can say to that is that our municipal plan was reviewed in 2013. Mm -hmm. I was part of that along with my mayor. And uh, so, and that at that time we were governed under urban planning of Moncton. Today we have our own planners. So we are reviewing that today to try and meet the needs of today's society. And, you know, that's important that we share that with people. And people do say, we recognize that you have to address the needs. We are looking at multiple different types of houses, but we need to get through this committee workshop before we get to that point. What do we need to change in the municipal plan? What do we need to do? And how do we accommodate the residents? We, you know, our goal is to, to not push the residents away. We want to hear from them. We want to hear what their ideas are so that we can incorporate it. We heard last night somebody says, well, you know what, are we telling the developer that they need electric chargers. Well, that's not addressed in our municipal plan, but it's something that we can be looking at. I mean, are we gonna be putting that in the plan? We don't know yet, but these are things that we need to look at. It's uh, gonna be a tough one. <clears throat> you can't please everybody, but I think we have to work towards communication piece needs to be out there clear, <clears throat> engaging the people what is it you want to see? How do you want to see Riverview look? We do have situation where there's R1s, which is residential, and we have R3. As a town, we don't dictate to the developer where to buy land, okay? I mean, they buy it, and then they decide what they're going to do. They have to meet the criteria of the plan. They take it to planning. It goes to the uh, the PAC committee, uh, or we send it to the PAC committee. It comes to council. So there's a process that we have to go through. It's not what you call rubber stamping. I want to turn for a second, if you don't mind, to balancing the issues that you have, which you just talked about, which is housing, zoning, which is, which is an important issue that a lot of municipalities are dealing with. The average resident has their own unique individual issues. They have very micro issues, crosswalks, potholes, sidewalks, 
you name it, you have probably heard it over the last six years or eight, ten, almost 10 years in political office. How do you balance the growth of your community with the growth of the individual issue? Because at the end of the day, municipalities have a very limited supply of money. They cannot run deficits no matter how much they want to. They probably know that they can't. How do you balance the needs of the community when they pay their taxes, when they pay their property taxes, they want to feel like their community is helping them succeed. How do you balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the community? Great question. I think it's important that we as council keep in mind that we have our budget binders and we've debated that we've shared that and it's online to everybody. And quite often somebody will say, well, you know, I want a crosswalk down here on Coverdale, but you know, I'll look into it. We look into, we put it on the agenda for the budget. Now we've had one that's gonna come up. Uh, it's been approved, but actually it all takes time to get, and we have to keep in mind, and yes, it's coming, yes, it's coming. The one over in Gunningsville took two years to get there, but we just have to keep them in the comfort zone. How do we, you know, accomplish all of these things. And we have to explain to them that this is the budget that we've approved. This is what we're going to fix. Here's the streets that we're going to do. And so we're not gonna please everybody, but for the most part, they do come on board. You know, we it's, it's, it's a juggling act that we have to do, but we have to be honest with our residents. They trust us and we have to build that relationship. I, I appreciate the honesty part there because I can imagine not being honest to the electorate is probably one of the worst things that you could do in municipal politics because if you lie to them, you break their trust, they're not going to come talking to you next time when they have issues. So I appreciate that. I want to flip the script a little bit for a second because I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things that are happening in the community. What's the thing that Riverview gets right? What is the thing that when you go talk to municipal leaders across New Brunswick or when you go sit in these zone meetings at the UMNB conferences, what is the thing that you boast about and you tell other municipal leaders, you know what, you might be doing it good, Riverview's getting it done better? Well, I really <laughs> like because because... Um, you know, when I actually joined UMB, I wanted to be organized because I'm a busy person. So I said to my colleague, we need to have a schedule and we need to engage the municipalities. Who's going to host each event? We have very a nice guideline of minutes, which we're trying to encourage other municipalities to do. And I think Andrew Black and I are very proud of that. We're very proud that we have a board meeting. We come out, we do... Uh, so a summary highlights of that board meeting and goes out to our members. Any kind of communication that comes from the office uh, of the UMB and it pertains to the resident, we share, we just share. Um, what we do in Riverview is that, or just not in Riverview, in zone two, we've added the CAOs and the clerks, all the staff that were directors on our list so that they can share that information with the municipalities as well. So keep in mind, we do have some smaller municipalities that don't have the resources that maybe Riverview does, or maybe, you know, Tatramara has. So we share the information. So that will help them along as well. Um, we do have an open mic session at our zone meetings where we listen to what people have to say and we learn from each other what's going on. So some of them are saying we're going to have town hall meetings, but maybe town hall meetings may not fit for review. Maybe we have to look at something else. So these are the kinds of things of sharing information uh, and growing together is, is really, really important. So I want to turn to my last subject here, and it's my favorite subject, and that is tourism. As I said in our pre-interview, I'm coming to Riverview later on this year. I'm doing a big swing through Atlantic Canada, but I'm starting in New Brunswick, and I've got many stops with many municipalities along the way. So I'm looking for the next great tourism destination in New Brunswick. What are some of the hidden gems in Riverview that you recommend to any tourist coming to your community? You come to Riverview, please visit Mill Creek. It is unique. It's our gem. And we need you to come because, you know, we're looking at 300 uh, acres of special ground. I mean, we've got trails in there. We've got the water. We've got everything you can imagine. 
any time that you come to anybody comes to your review weekends, it's packed. And we can't wait for the new rec center to be built because it's going to be at the very beginning of our trail. Uh, Riverview has excellent trails and they're busy. People walking and using our trails. So I encourage people to come out. We have our bike trails, walking trails. We have Mill Creek. It's unique in itself. Where do you go? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of budget meetings, is there a spot in the community that you can go and decompress and just let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and try to make your community better off than you left it the day before? Well, after a long day in that home, <laughs> talk to my husband with a glass of wine <laughs> and relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love honest answers. I love honest <laughs> answers. So I'm going to ask the final question here because it's the important one that I like to put on the record here. In your opinion, what makes the town of Riverview such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It is a family, um, unique town. Uh, you know, it, it's just a rich enhancement to live in this community. It's, it's got a wonderful feel. It's something unique that I've lived in many communities. This town is very, very welcoming. And actually, it, it enhances our, our quality of life. And I think the quality of life is very important in Riverview because we can enjoy all kinds of activities, keep it healthy, walking trails, you name it, it's here. And so that's, I think, how I see Riverview. Uh, easy to get around. We, we're easy to get to the capital city, easy to get to Halifax. We're handy to everything. And we have free parking. So that is important. That is good to know from a tourist perspective that I won't have to pay for parking. So thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, Cecile, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this has been a fantastic 40, almost 45 minutes of chatting with you, talking about your community, talking about yourself. I feel like we've just scratched the surface. So hopefully when I'm in Riverview later on this summer, you and I will be able to grab a coffee, sit down and con continue this conversation in person because I have a newfound respect for municipal leaders in New Brunswick because they seem so lively and so energetic and so bubbly. And you've just cemented that idea in my head. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. And I look forward to meeting you. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now on YouTube or follow us wherever you're listening. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch show that you have come to enjoy and appreciate over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but always, just keep talking.